Kitty, your video is on, just FYI. Is it off now? Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Justin Cayley. I'm Marketing Manager for National Geographic Learning. And I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this first session of a three-part National Geographic Learning webinar series on best practices for teaching uh, online. Today, we're, we're joined by Werner Kuhn, a passionate English language teacher uh, with a particular expertise in the area of online education. Uh, so today, Werner is going to present some ideas for teachers that are faced with moving their classes online from the physical classroom to the virtual world. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for what will hopefully be a very timely and informative webinar for everyone. Before we get started, I'd just like to take a minute to introduce uh, everyone to some of the functionality of this webinar platform, which you can use to interact with the presenter and the other attendees. Uh, today's presentation will be interactive, and we encourage you to take part in the discussion by using some of these tools. Uh, first off, at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there are several different icons. Uh, the first button on the left is the chat function. 
Please use this to type your reply to any questions that the presenter asks during the session. Uh, please be sure to send your message to all panelists and attendees. This is important uh, to ensure that the whole group can read all of your messages. Also, uh, on the right, you'll see a Q&A button. Uh, please use this to ask the presenter or host's questions or to make a request. We'll do our best to answer questions as they come in. Uh, there'll also be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the session, and you can use this function at that time. Uh, all, as well, uh, finally, you know, if you're having difficulty seeing the screen that the presenter is showing at any time, please make sure that your view options are set to fit to window so that you can view the entire screen. That's it for the functionality. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our featured speaker for this morning's webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today uh, Werner Kuhn. Uh, Werner has been a language teacher for over 19 years and currently operates his own school catering to children and adults. His passion is to combine technology and education to improve educational outcomes for teachers and students alike. Werner is also a teacher trainer specializing in both face-to-face -face and remote sessions, helping schools set up their online teaching programs. Uh, he's played an integral role in a variety of English language teaching projects, including arranging and planning summer and winter camp sessions and speaking and presenting at large EFL industry and university events. Currently, Werner is working on establishing an online system to allow IELTS and TOEFL students to improve their scores online. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Werner. Werner, please take it away. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me and National Geography Learning this morning for this special series of webinars aimed at getting teachers online. Before we begin, I would quickly like to do a, a poll to see which sections you guys are teaching in at the, uh, at the moment. Yeah, you guys should be able to see the poll on your screen. You can select the ones that apply to you. All right, uh, let's quickly have a look at the results. I'm gonna ask Andrew to show us the results. There we go. Oh, most of you are teaching in primary grade with about 68% right now, grades one to six. And then we have um, teens, 47%, around about um, seven to 12 year olds. And then kindergarten and pre-primary, at 39%, that's not bad. University students at 16% and then adults at 13%. Okay, great. Well, let's get started. Um, as Johnson mentioned, I've been teaching in Taiwan for about 19 years. During that time, I was fortunate enough to be exposed to a variety of teaching environments, which really helped me hone my skills into what they are today. About 10 years ago, I started focusing on digital teaching and how we can implement the reaches that is digital teaching into our everyday teaching. Three years ago, we opened a school and aimed at digital teaching for both children and adults. Therefore, today I am here to share with you what I've learned during my time experimenting with digital teaching. It's been quite a journey. All right, let's dive right in and look at what you will find in this webinar. We will start with making the switch to uh, online teaching, where I'll look at equipment and materials. We will then move on to differences between digital and classroom teaching. And finally, we will end the session with a quick look at how to conduct an online class. Finally, all the links that I will discuss today will be posted in the chat box. 
So if you guys see so if you guys see an app or you see a service I'm referring to, you can also refer to the chat box. We will find the link to that service. All right, let's start making the switch to online teaching. All right. So I have another question I want to ask you guys is um, how many people here are already teaching online, starting online teaching soon, or will teach online in the new future? Right, let's have a look there. Sixty five percent of you are already teaching online. Um and another nineteen percent will likely teach online in the future, and then we have ten percent at starting to teach online soon, and six percent of you have no plans to teach online, but who knows? <laughs> That's true, who knows, right? All right. So let's see, uh making the switch to online teaching. Yes, we talked about the big O, right? Online. With recent events around the world, it has become more and more important than ever that we are ready and with an alternative teaching environment. I know a lot of teachers have concerns about online teaching, and today I want to address some of those concerns. Now, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today is from our personal experience going online with our schools and addressing teachers' uh, teachers' questions. So first, um, we're going to look at equipment and setup. And this part can be divided into two groups, things that we are familiar with and then things that we need to pay attention to. Let's first look at things that we are familiar with. We already know that the items on the list is self-explanatory and common sense. However, with the rush uh, of getting adapted to our new teaching environment, uh, it might become, we might overlook certain things that we take for granted. So therefore, I'm asking you to indulge me for a few seconds as I'm talking about these common things. If you um, experience frequent dips in internet traffic, it is worth it to consult with your local service provider or your network technician. Um, because when we first opened Utopia, we applied for 300 megabyte fiber optic internet, which is, which is quite, quite fast. However, we experienced a lot of dips in, in traffic, which made it almost impossible for us to stream anything. We will go, if we stream live, it will cut out. If we try to have a meeting, it will cut out. So after a lot of going back and forth, it eventually turned out that one of the, one of the equipments were, were, were faulty. So it's really, it's really important to make sure that you look at those basic things and make sure they are stable enough the second thing that we have to pay attention to is the webcam. You don't need the latest, greatest 4K webcam with night vision. In fact, this might have the opposite effect of what you think. Not all students have good internet connection. And for some students, they might have to rely on public, public Wi-Fi provided by the city or maybe at nearest McDonald's or something like that. And therefore, your 4K image that you are projecting might actually make things worse. And if the bandwidth is too slow, it might actually get reduced down to 480 or 720p, which is not good. It's not very good quality. Okay, you guys, for example, if you watch a, a YouTube video, you can see the difference between HD and 480 or 720. All right. So sometimes just having a good webcam is enough. It doesn't have to be the latest or the greatest one. And then finally, a good clean background. Now, I'm currently sitting in my office, and I actually want to show you guys a little something. Um, this is the this is the whole office back there. So even for this webinar, I created a, a divider to to make it clean and simple in the background, so it's it's not distracting for for most people. You know, as an adult, if you are watching a webinar or you're watching something and there's, there's many things in the background, it is a little bit frustrating. But for children, that is pure torture. Because there's so many things happening in the background that almost makes it impossible for them to focus on you. All right. 
Now let's look at the things that we should consider. The first thing we have to consider obviously is a stable meeting software. And there are definitely a lot of meeting software. There are things like Google Meet and Skype, or I know some teachers even use Facebook Live. For myself, I prefer to use Zoom. Uh, Zoom has all the functions I need. It makes it easy for me to, to share with my students. And I think the balance of all the functions I need is quite, is quite stable in Zoom. We have used it, we've been using it for a couple of years now and always with good results. <clears throat> so what do I mean by stable? It should be something that you have worked with before. And ideally you have, should, you have locked a few sessions on, on this program and it worked without major glitches. Sometimes software, the, the audio will cut out or the video will disappear or the whole program will freeze. So we, look, we are looking for something that is stable in the functions. You can rely on that function to always be there. All right, next. Um, the next thing we look at is the internet signal. Although Wi-Fi is great for most things, when you are running a digital classroom, from your computer, you will get better results and stability if you use a wire connection. Wi-Fi tends to lose signal from time to time, which can affect your class greatly and can cause unneeded stress to students and parents on the other side of the camera. This part is a little bit, um, as a student consuming your content, they can use Wi-Fi. It's not, it's not that serious, but for you as a teacher, you have to you you have to make it as stable as you can because you are sharing everything you are sending the video you are sending the materials so at least your part must be as stable as it can be and then finally it brings us to our devices now i'm personally experiment with ipad a lot i'm trying to move to an all ipad um, environment so logically, I will run Zoom sessions from my iPad. However, I can unequivocally tell you today that is not a good idea. All right, it's difficult to operate since you have to share materials with students, deal with chat rooms, keep an eye on the video feed. It is much easier to do all of that from your desktop or your laptop. Plus, you don't have to spend special dongles to get your iPad connected by, by wire. As a student in your class, tablets will be fine, like I said before, and because most of the time they are just consuming your content or maybe annotating or something like that. It's a very, an, an internet traffic is a very low data bandwidth activity. And then one, as a side note here, I would like to mention that we encourage parents and students not to use mobile devices, especially mobile phones. Since the screen is really, really small, so we will, if parents ask us, we will always recommend that maybe they use an iPad or even better if they can use a computer. So the, the screen they use is, is much bigger and it's better for their, for their eyes. All right, let's look at what's next. Now, now that the hardware is all done, let's have a quick look at the software. There is a myriad of options out there. But really the ones that, that I feel is good for teaching includes uh, Zoom, Skype, WebEx, and Google Meet. Like I said before, my preference is Zoom, just because I feel the functions is easy to use, it's not difficult to explain to my students and even to the students' parents. So what can you do in Zoom? Well, Zoom not only allows you to share your screen with students and make annotations, they can see in real time, but the students themselves can also annotate. So for example, if you put something on the screen, for example, uh, let's say I have, a, I have a worksheet. I can annotate, they can annotate. We can all work together, which makes a, a online class much more interactive, all right? And it helps to keep the students focused and keep them engaged in the lesson. Uh, in a class environment, especially if you are teaching children, you have to keep students' attention a lot, but if they are at home or they're in an online class, it's even more difficult for you to keep their attention. So we have to make our activities especially interactive. Uh, whereas you teach adults or even university students, 
they tend to zone out. Like they will look at the screen, but they tend to zone out and start thinking about everything, other things. So you constantly have to change up things and give them things to do to also keep their attention. Other than this, Zoom allows you, the teacher to share almost things from anywhere, which makes it really amazing. You can share apps and content from your iPad or even your iPhone, um, which is really beneficial if you have some special app you want to share with them or you have something you, you want to show them that's only available on your iPad or iPhone, you can do that. And there are some amazing apps out there for practicing a variety of content. And you can keep them, it helps you to keep them focused. If you have, um, <clears throat> I know uh, some, some publishers have online content that you can also help to share with students, uh, which makes it easier to, to prepare for your class in the end. And finally, one is probably one of the, the best features for me is the fact that you can record the lesson. Because after, after we've done an online lesson, we will record the lesson and then after that we will upload it to our LMS. Uh, our LMS is a learning management system. In our case, we are using something called Shobi. And we can upload it to Shobi and then the students can actually go look at it at home. So they can go through it. If, if we were like, if we were reading a book or we were talking about something, they can go review that and make sure that everything, everything is okay. The nice thing about this is that if a student didn't understand something, they can actually play the video over and over, which makes it much easier for them to understand. All right. Um, currently, I don't want to talk about too much about Zoom. There is a lot of videos going around on the internet about how to set up Zoom. Uh, we have two videos, one is a Chinese version and one is an English version, but you can quickly have a look to set up Zoom for, for teaching, especially to, to give the students and the parents uh, some idea of what they need to do. All right, so now let's have a look at online materials. How, how do we deal with our online material? This section is divided into three parts. We have materials, files, and resources. Let's take a closer look at each of these, starting with materials. All right, the first and probably the most important thing to remember when it comes to online is different platform, different thinking. You guys will hear me say this a lot during this webinar because it's super important. I really cannot say this enough. With a new platform, we get to do things differently. Therefore, materials that we are planning to use during the session should be A, accessible. This means that you should need to go through, you shouldn't need to go through several file hierarchies to find your files. It causes you stress, it causes the student stress. Things should be set up already. So basically, you can just quickly share it. Put it in a folder where you can find it easily. The second thing is, Preload windows in advance. For example, if you want to share a video or you want to share a website, preload those things and open the videos on your desktop. So when you are sharing, you can easily go select that window and share it with the students. And then the last one for this is separate text heavy documents. Now, what you see on your screen right now is what I mean is um, it's a page from one, from one of my books in the Explore Our World series. and just displaying this page on the right, the whole page, displaying that to the students will make it very difficult for them because first of all, if a student is on a small device, for example, a mobile phone or a small tablet, all of this gets condensed into a very small space, which means that the word is extremely small. Therefore, you can, we like to separate our documents into two parts. So let's for example say I'll make one slide with the pictures and I'll make one slide with the text. All right. So you can see after we after we separated them, that the text part of the of the document is much, much bigger. And it's easy for the students to see and it's easy for them to work with this because they have space to annotate, they have space to write, et cetera. All right. Then the next part we have is talking about file size. So we looked at our materials and how to organize them. Let's look at the actual files. If you look at, if you take a closer look on the chart, 
where's my chart? There. If you look at that chart, then you will see as the files get bigger, it takes longer to load. Now, in most cases where we have high-speed internet, this is not a very big problem unless your files are like videos. But if you're if you're that student that relies on public Wi-Fi or you have to go to the local Starbucks to just to just get a Wi-Fi signal, this will become a problem. So if you have a very heavy, very big file, it might load really slowly for your learners, which might make them confused and they cannot follow exactly what you're talking about. So what do we as teachers do about this, all right? First, we keep our file sizes small. Now to do this, especially pictures make files bigger. And here we tend to, we tend to find pictures that is too big. For example, something that is 3,000 by 3,000 is way too much. Some, uh, a picture 1080 by 1080 is enough. It will still have a good quality and the file size is not so big. All right, so be mindful when you choose your picture. Also, different file sizes for, um, have different problems. For example, something that is, the file extension is PNG or TIFF, those are very high quality images. And normally they don't have a background, but they are much bigger. Whereas you use something just like a JPG or a JPEG, that will be much smaller file size and the quality will still be good. Another thing that I see a lot of teachers like to use is called GIF, G-I-F. And um, I, I have mixed feelings about this one because they really make the, the lesson more interesting because then a student can see something funny or they can see some small GIF, it, it really grabs their attention. But sometimes the file size can also be much, much bigger. Okay. All right, then um, the last one is about videos. Do not embed videos in your presentation. So what I mean by this is like, for example, do not put the actual video file into your PowerPoint or into your keynote. It will make the size unbelievably big. It's better to link that to a video, video site, for example, like YouTube or Vimeo or whatever site is popular in your region, and then actually play the video from there. Because that way it's not, you're not taking up your bandwidth and you're using their, their resources to stream your videos. Okay. But my personal favorite is I usually make my presentations and then convert them to PDF. Uh, I just set up my PDF so that it makes a slide for every um, for every transition I have. So I can still have my slide transitions and my files in PDF, which makes it much, much smaller and easier for students to, to deal with. All right, <clears throat> let's look at what's next. Um, finally, once all our materials and files have been set up, we need to think about what resources we would like to use. Now, these can be external websites, or videos or apps, there are a lot of resources out there that we can use for our class. The most important part is make sure that everything is signed in and loaded. But what I mean here is like, if you, for example, uh, I'm sure some teachers here have used Kahoot before, and to set up Kahoot is not a difficult process, it's just a lot of steps. You have to first, uh, well, if you, if you haven't found it, you have to find one, you have to log in, find one, you have to set it up, you have to get the pin code, and then you have to, you know, there's a lot of things to do. So I like to get up, get set up everything, get it ready, get my Kahoot ready, get to the page where I have to get, I have the pin. And when it's time to do those activities, I just go. I give the students the pin and then they can just quickly log in. All right. So make sure that whatever websites or things you are using are ready to go and otherwise, what happens is, for example, if I first have to log into a website, maybe I have to add my password, which means that I have to stop my screen share. Once I stop my screen share, that means that my students will lose concentration and it will take me some time to, to get it back. All right. So doing that a few times during the class and you can easily spend half your class just trying to focus your students, which also wastes a lot of valuable time. All right. Um, next, we have differences between online and classroom teaching. Now, <clears throat> these, are, these are really important because 
the the way that we teach online and the way we teach um, in the classroom is a little bit different because the situation is different. Remember what I said earlier, right? Change your think, uh, change the platform, change your thinking. It is really important. So, one question that many people ask me is, what about our books? Is there a place for traditional books on online teaching? So let's have a look at what's what's happening there. So first, um, we're going to talk about what online teaching is and what online teaching is, isn't. All right, let's first look at what it isn't. First of all, just showing videos from YouTube or other sites is definitely not online teaching. It is a mere time filler activity. I have seen teachers that, um, when we first started teaching online, uh, I was trying to find other teachers with similar things. I was trying to, to see what we can do, how can we collaborate to work together. And then, so if, if a teacher tell me, oh, they teach online or something like that, I will always ask them if they mind if I come there to observe their class or see something. And it was a little bit shocking to see how many teachers think showing videos from YouTube or showing videos from somewhere else is considered online teaching. So therefore, we have to really define what is online teaching in our environment, okay? And normally to be considered online teaching, uh, a thing like a video class needs to be accompanied by other things like um, comprehension, activities that test comprehension, collaboration or communication. All right. Neither neither is playing games or doing research or asking your students to email their homework to you so you can check that. None of these things are really considered online teaching until it has been connected with other activities to make it a lesson. All right. So first thing you have to identify is what it is not. But then let's look at what is called, what can be considered online teaching. <clears throat> now, normally um, there's a centralized theme. For example, you have a you have a topic you want to talk about, and let's for example take this recent events we are experiencing the coronavirus, right? And so, what will an online lesson about this look like? So first, we will have a small discussion where we will ask an uh, open-ended question. For example, why are we teaching online? All right, this, this question will help the students to brainstorm a little bit, and eventually it will bring us to the coronavirus. Because students will tell you like, oh, we have to teach online because there's a virus making us sick or something that's making us sick and blah, blah, blah. Uh, which then segue us into the video part. So now you have time to show the video, all right. But during, uh, after your, um, after your open-ended discussion question, you also want to give them some chance to, to brainstorm their activities. Maybe you can pull up a whiteboard function and get students to write down things on the screen for you. Or you can give them a little brain, um, uh, a brain chart where, they, where you put corona in the middle and you can ask them to fill in the bubbles for you. There's a lot of things you can do. But once we get to the video, then again, um, the corona video is run, let's for example say this video is run about 15 minutes. Obviously, <clears throat> I cannot show a 15 minute video in one go, especially not online. So what do I do? I divide my video into different sections. For this specific video, I will choose four sections. Maybe the origin of the virus, so that's one. Structure of the virus, effects of the virus, and prevention of the virus, okay? So I do one section, and after every section, I will offer the student some kind of review. Okay, so I will do one section maybe for three or four minutes, and then we will do a small activity. This can be a discussion. It can be a whiteboard activity. It can be something like Kahoot or Mentimeter. There's so many things you can do. All right, so, and then I'll move on to the next section. Once I finish the next section, then again, I will give them some kind of activity and then move on to the next section. So instead of just showing one video for 15 minutes, I actually divide it into different parts. And then they can now, every, every section, they can do some activity to help them concentrate again, and then we can move on to the next part. Now, something I like to do when I show this kind of videos, I like to use a service called Curiosity Stream. 
And I specifically like this service because their videos are really informative. It is based on on education. It is made for education. So I like to to show their videos. They have really interesting stuff, and it's really for me because I use the National Geography books. I, I really love this, this, this website because it really connects with their materials. It talks about interesting stuff that you can easily find videos and connect to your classes. All right, and then next, uh, when I finally finish my online, my, my, my online set part, then I will circle back to the books. All right, so now I can go back to, because I have done my, my coronavirus little thing. Now I can circle back, for example, in the Our World Level 4 book. Unit four talks about uh, staying healthy. So now I go back to that lesson and I will, we can discuss about germs and we can talk about what do you do when you're feeling sick, <clears throat> which actually helps this. So this 15 minute video that I showed in the beginning will then eventually turn into a 45 minute to one hour class. And the students have learned a lot during that time instead of just watching one video for 15 minutes. They learned vocabulary, they learned some grammar, they learned conversation, and eventually they connected back to their own material they already have in their <clears throat> in their class. All right. Then let's have a look at next uh, skills to practice online. All right. Here we're going to do another poll quickly, and my question is: What is the most useful online resource to have? All right. We'll ask Andrew to quickly put that up on the screen. Okay, while we're waiting for Andrew to put it up, let's quickly have a look. Um, online teaching can be a little bit difficult sometimes if we are not prepared. Oh, there's our poll now. Okay, let's try to look at our poll. What are the most useful online resources to have? The PDF files of the class materials. PowerPoints that have already been made for use, or ebooks and apps. <clears throat> All right, let's have a look at the results. <clears throat> While I'm waiting for the results, um, I just saw uh, Julie Julie Fishman also mentioned uh, Can, Can Academy. That's also another great website that uh, that has very very nice things to use. Thanks, Judy for Julie for that um, suggestion. All right, what are the most useful online resources to have? About 23% said PDF files, 52% uh, said PowerPoint that have already been made for use. Okay. And ebooks and apps. Great. About 25% said ebooks and apps. Okay, interesting. All right, let's have a look at what's next. All right, so as we have seen through this section of online teaching, it isn't just a video or a game, uh, it requires additional activities to add value to the media being consumed so and through this session we have seen that there are a variety of skills that needs to be built and create to create successful online lessons so now let's look at each of these skills a little closer and examine what they mean first we have teamwork so these skills are specifically designed for if you want to have an online class and make your online class efficient and useful for your students we have to make sure that these little, these small skills have been honed to per almost perfection. The first one is teamwork. In a class setting, it is almost taken for granted when we assign activities. But in an online environment, teamwork becomes crucial to the success of the lesson. Everyone can, can talk at the same time, but everyone needs to be engaged at the same time. Therefore, we teach our students teamwork skills like assignment, deadline creation, sharing ideas, and presenting their work. The more efficient they become in these mini skills, the more efficient the teamwork will become. Okay. Now, I want to share with you guys quickly. Um, earlier, 
now we're already in April last month I I we, we did a we did a zoom practice class with one of the younger kids younger classes to, to just to, be, to get ready and I forgot to tell my students that <clears throat> I forgot to tell my students that when you sign in, you have to switch off your microphone. And this is a class about a f about 14 students. So as soon as they signed in, it was chaos. Like everybody was just talking at the same time. And I, I think we almost broke Zoom. So eventually I, I quickly had to mute all and then explain everything to them. They had like, come keep it down. And then slowly they, they got into it. But that's really important because online you have to, we must make sure every student know exactly what what they need to do. All right. The next one is let's look at voicing your opinions. In a class environment, we might control who is speaking, um, and you might keep some students at bay because uh, as you are teaching your class, you can see when somebody is going to interrupt. They have this special look in their face, so you can tell them to not talk, or you can with a hand gesture or a look. You know, you can keep them at bay. But online, we don't have that power. Online, if somebody wanna talk, they're going to talk. So it becomes really important to teach them speaking etiquette. Like if somebody is talking, you have to wait or you have to wait for a chance to talk, not at the same time. All right, that will help us to create an environment where people can really transmit their ideas easily. All right, once we got to get them to follow the rules and regulations for teamwork and voicing opinions, we need to teach the students to always connect current knowledge with what they've learned previously, especially linking online materials with classroom books. This is really important because they still have books and they still have, they still have their workbooks and their readers. So we need to connect what we do online with the things that they already have. All right. And then um, for me personally, I will keep a list of, of uh, my student book chapters I have. So when I'm doing something online, then I can keep, I can keep a list of see like, oh, th and this unit we talked about, this topic which matches this. So I will keep reminding my students, like remember in unit four, we talked about this, or remember in unit one, we talked about how to help animals or something like that. So I keep helping them to connect back to things they already learned. All right, and then after another habit I had to cultivate myself was I had to start collecting digital material. Now this part is, is more of a, like I say, it's a habit, it's not just something you do once. Um, as I went, you know, everything recently, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, most things allows you to save information. So that's what I had to learn to do. I had to start doing, if I see a video on Facebook, I saved it. If I see something on Instagram, I bookmark it. If I see something on YouTube I like, I will put it into a playlist. And I keep these, these lists of data, this list of media. And then every time I teach a lesson, then I get a chance, if there's an opportunity, I can always connect that to the lesson. Um, a couple of months ago, we, we had a lesson in, um, I believe it was the, the Explorer World Unit 3, and they talked about animals. And then, um, and I don't know how, how it happened, but eventually we ended up at kangaroos. And I remember I saw this video online of um, Australian, an Australian guy punching a kangaroo in the face to, to share, uh, to save his dog. So I quickly pulled up that video from one of the lists that I saved it on. And I shared that with my students and I, I will never forget how they lit up that day. Because first of all, the video was funny, it was engaging and it really sparked a huge debate because now, now all of a sudden students were asking like, uh, are kangaroos dangerous and why are, how big are they? And what, what do they eat dogs or something like that? But we had such an engaging discussion that day that actually everything else had to stop so we can facilitate this discussion. So, but that is the power of, of media and bringing things to your students. All right, <clears throat> let's move on to online and traditional materials. So now that we have established what is considered online teaching, let's talk a little talk about materials. 
three of the most asked questions I receive at my school from the teachers that's teaching here were, first, how do I get my books digital? How much time will I spend creating PowerPoints? And how do I check my homework? Okay. Let's first look at the physical materials we already have. There are two ways to deal with these things. The first one is to contact the publisher. And I strongly recommend this. And get more information from your publisher. And a lot of the time they have, they have things that, that you don't even know about or they have things that they can share with you for online teaching. And that is really, it makes things a lot easier. But then again, there is also, fortunately the, the bigger, the bigger uh, publishers are moving to online teaching or digital teaching, which makes it which makes materials uh, more varied and what you can use. I personally love the things from from National Geography learning geographic learning sorry because when we choose our publisher uh, we 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 definitely looked at the digital side and for us this um, this this specific publisher really had the things we need they had whiteboard software they had ebooks they had powerpoint that was all the things we needed for our program and it also looked like in the future they will focus on digital teaching also so that was important for us and when you choose your publisher it's also important that you take some time and look at what is their philosophy what is their viewpoint to see if um, will they follow with the times or do what what is their what is their game plan that's really important okay and because a lot of a lot of teachers also said that teaching that Preparing PowerPoint is a waste of time. However, I feel that it's not because I created I create a PowerPoint with something awesome right now. And the next time I teach this book, I can add more awesome content to this, which means that PowerPoint is just getting better and better. Okay. However, if your publisher haven't switched completely yet, some of them is a little bit slower to switch, you have to make your own. By making custom PowerPoints that contain the text for readers and other materials, remember the aim here is to keep students engaged and focus on your lesson. You don't want them to fumble through their books or trying to find which page. Maybe by the time they find the page, you're already on the next page. You don't want the situation. Okay. So the other thing you can do is <clears throat> you can use materials from a website called Teachers Pay Teachers. Now, it's an amazing group of people that works there. This, these are made by by teachers. They make worksheets that, that they use in their classes that you can get from them. And they, they really have amazing stuff. I'm normally able to find something that, that match my curriculum very easily, especially when it comes to things like phonics, reading, writing, or speaking. They are usually dead on in what they provide. Right, here's an example of some of the materials that other teachers create and being put for fast to use. I really believe that this is the way of the future, this, this collaboration way. Through our collaboration and sharing, we will build a strong collective of teachers and resources. So the first one I show you here is a little bit about uh, reading and phonics, where the students will have to, uh, to read that, the specific phonics text. All right. And this was, this was made by two different amazing teachers. But the most important part here is the time I spent to get it to my students and get them practicing was less than one minute. And the, the amount of paper I used was almost nothing. I didn't have to go spend hours to create these amazing things. I only, I, I got it from Teacher Scrape teachers and that was it. Then I could use it. All right. Other of, um, this one covers reading and speaking or writing if you want. Now I combine this with my Explore Our World textbooks and you have lessons that will, some of these lessons will even blow the teacher's mind. All right. For example, like uh, these two packages, the one is a reading package, the other one is a writing prompt. I paid three, three US dollars for these two packages three years ago. And I've been using it ever since. 
and it's just amazing. Like there's almost a year's worth of comprehension and a year's worth of of writing. That the writing prompts are actually converted to speaking prompts, but still, I mean, this is so easy to use. And then like three dollars a cup of coffee. It is it's really amazing. And this this website never ever disappoints me. All right, let's move on to what does an online lesson actually look like? So I want to share with you guys quickly about how do I do this? Okay. So first I will, let's for example, say in our, in our book, we had a lesson about animals and then we have, we followed that up with a reading about crocodiles. And then after I did my reading with crocodiles and my comprehension, I can play some game with Kahoot or Quizlet or something like that. And then finally I can add a, a, a speaking part. Like for example, maybe I choose an emoji story about animals and then my students will have to do recording or a writing based on that. All right, before we continue, I quickly want to um, circle back to, to three questions. Just the three things I asked in the beginning. How do I get my books digital? Okay, so number one, you can talk to your publishers. They normally have something for you. Number two was, how much time will I spend creating PowerPoints? If you do it alone, Honestly, you will spend a lot of time. But if you work together, if if maybe different teachers at your school or different teachers in your community, if you guys work together or you use um, you use amazing places like Teachers by Teachers, it is fairly quick. And then the last question I didn't answer yet was how can I check my homework? Now here you have to check, you have to use your LMS, your uh, learning management system. I normally get my students, if I do, if they do book homework, let them, they can do that, take a picture for me and then upload it to our LMS where I can annotate it and then the system will let them know that I'm finished with that. All right. So next is conducting an actual online class. So first I wanna ask you guys a quick question. What is the most frightening thing about teaching online? <clears throat> All right, keeping the attention of online students. 78% of you said that. Getting through the workload and setting up everything, the technical issues. Okay, great. All right. Yes, keeping attention is definitely a, a, a mission that we have to follow. All right, so we looked at making the switch online. We discussed the differences between online teaching and traditional teaching, and we figured out what to do with material. You are online, so now you're online, the first students are entering the room. The rest comes naturally. I mean, you are teachers, right? It doesn't matter if you're offline or off, off, online or offline. However, and remember what I said, as I mentioned before, different platform, different thinking. So two things you will have to pay attention to uh, is that as different from class is definitely the way we give instructions and the way we monitor our students. Okay, let's first have a look at giving instructions. Now, giving instructions can be divided into two parts, body language, and second is your instructional language. Let's first take a look at body language. Now, body language is the way our body moves. When we're in the classroom, we can move freely uh, with big, fast movements, and students can easily follow. However, when things are online, it's a lot more complex. Fast moving, fast moving actions can become very blurry. Like if you, if you move very quickly, it, it, it's blurry. Another thing is if the students have weak internet, it might be choppy. So they might not even see your action or they might actually just catch the first part or the last part. And if you do your actions too quickly, there is no break between them. So the students cannot distinguish between which action was this and which what is a new action. So it's, so it's important to, to slow down do your actions big, slowly, and deliberately. And between different actions, you can use different, 
you can have pauses to make sure that the students get a chance to catch up with what's going on. All right. And then one thing we also have to remember is we constantly have to check for feedback from students because we cannot physically see them. We can see them on the video feed, but it is not in the classes where we can see their body language, you can see their, we can see their eyes to make sure they understand. So <clears throat> there's, a, there's a children's game called Stoplight. And um, basically you have three, you have a red, a, ye a yellow and a green cup. Now we converted this to an online game as well. I give my students like a pan, uh, like a paddle. So I give them a, green, uh, a yellow paddle and a red paddle. And if they don't understand or they feel unclear, they will show this this panel to the to the camera. It's very easy to spot if somebody have a yellow a yellow dot or a green or a red dot on the screen. And then that way I can see that students are understanding. If there's no paddle, I know everything as well, and we can keep moving on. Okay. The next one is our instructional language. Now, this part is the way we talk to students. Now, I quickly want to show you guys an example of an instruction. If you look at this example, it is even, even in the classroom, this might be a little bit difficult to follow because there's too many things to do. So when it comes to classroom, we'll break it down into the four actions, we'll break down into two actions and we'll group things together. Right, for example, first take out your book and then read the sentence and then highlight the thing. Okay. However, the important part is here. Online, this will turn into almost five actions. Taking out your book is one action. Turn to page seven, that's another action. Read the first sentence, that is another action. We have to slow things down and make it step by step so students can easily follow what, what you are doing. And after each section, we have to ask for confirmation. We must make sure that everybody is done with that so we can move to the next one. All right. And then the last part that I want to talk about quickly is monitoring students. Now, when we monitor students, like I said, remember different platform, different thinking. And here we really have to, to monitor students, we have to do different things. We have to change activities. We have to create activities based on share information. Or we, we can do things like bo um, annotate both ways. Like for example, you put up something, they annotate it, and then you also, you can annotate and they can annotate. By keeping them this little missions, you know, little missions, you really have, we really keep them engaged in the lesson and you don't give them a chance to drift off or to start thinking about other things. And it also gives us a chance to make sure that they are on task and they are, they are doing the right thing, All right? For example, if you are doing a reading book, instead of asking them to read the book from their side, it's better to put up the text on the screen so that they can read from your screen. This way you can see that they are focusing on what, what is going on in front of them. And then the last part is the tools we use for monitoring. Now, there is a lot. You have more serious tools like Google Classroom, Classcraft, and uh, iTunes University. And then things that I like to use more is things like Nearpod, because um, basically you make a presentation and then the students can, can see it on their iPad and you control the flow of the presentation. They cannot get ahead or behind. Another one I love to use is Flipgrid. Uh, it's a place where you can make videos. You can get students to use videos to communicate and even comment on each other. And the last one is Class Dojo. Class Dojo is also a kind of a LMS. And I like Class Dojo for two reasons. One is their point function, so I can assign points to my students. And the other one is the portfolio part where you, they get, the students get to share work and things with the parents. And also we can, we as teachers can also connect with the parents and discuss things with them about the students' learning. All right. Then, basically, final thoughts. Um, I, I want to make sure you guys understand today's presentation was formatted in the, in the way that we will teach online. You will see that I have a lot of slides to talk about what is happening, like what, is, what are we going to do, what is the subsections of that, and then talk about that section. I made it very systematic 
so that students, uh, so that you guys, for example, can understand easily what, what we're talking about. And that's the same way that an online lesson should be formatted, all right, to make it really step by step to make sure everybody is on, on point. Okay. The other thing is um, talk to your publisher. They have a lot of things that really can help you. And also remember that um, remember that you can support other teachers with making materials. Teachers pay teachers. There's some uh, other places on Etsy that you can also find materials. Or just talk to the teachers in your environment and see if you guys can work together to, to, to make some materials that everybody can use. One more time, different platform, different thinking. This really can solve a lot of your problems. It doesn't mean because in the class we do it this way, you have to do it that way online, all right? And then as a thank you for today's, for joining the webinar today, I am making available a little cheat sheet uh, for Zoom, um, something that we created at our school that we sent to the parents uh, to tell them about how to connect to Zoom and if there's any problems, what they can do to help the students to, to solve some, some issues. And I'm making that <clears throat> I'm making that available as a PDF and as an editable file. So if you have to make changes for to fit it better for your school, you guys are welcome to do that. All right. Andrew just popped up the the download link there in the in the chat box. You guys are free to to take that. All right. And finally, um, I want to say thank you guys for joining the webinar. We have two more sets for this month, also talking about online teaching. And then um, there's one next Wednesday and there's one next, next Wednesday. In the, the, last, the last webinar on that Wednesday, we will also talk about some of the apps I mentioned today. And I'll give you guys a better look at how they look inside and what you can do. Okay, um, Justin, do we still have time for a few questions? Yeah, maybe. We, we, that, thank you very much, Werner. Uh, we do have a, a, a minute or two if uh, people have any questions for Werner as a, about his session or about anything on, on online teaching. Uh, if you'd like to, you can use the chat box or the Q&A uh, feature at this point. Um, Werner, maybe to, well, while if people are typing it in, I, I actually caught one question that I thought was pretty good from one teacher uh, as you were yeah. talking. Someone was curious to know how um, is it possible to do uh, teamwork activities online uh, in an online classroom? Is that something that you guys do in your in your uh, session at your school at Utopia? Uh, online online class uh, online teamwork, right? Yes, it is. Um, but we we we've structured it differently. Like that's why I use Flipgrid. For example, I will put um, Flipgrid is a video, it's a, that video service, right? Uh, we will use that for, for teamwork because in Zoom, it gets a little bit complicated if everybody's talking at the same time. But normally I will divide them into groups. Even our LMS can also divide students into group as well as class dojo. And then I'll add a group and then the students and that group, they need to finish a, a certain tasks and then share that back to, to the class so we all can see. It is a lot more challenging to do group work in uh, in an online class. So normally if I have to do it on Zoom, I will actually involve the whole class and ask them to, to communicate with each other. Got it. One other question uh, on the chat there. Is it, uh, there was a question about um, uh, webcams, if you, have a, if you have a webcam that you particularly like um, that, to, to use with your webinar or, or your classes. Oh, um, I'm using Logitech's uh, they have a, let me see, oh, I can't move that. Um, I'm using Logitech webcam, normally the, the, the middle of the range. Uh, so as long as that can go up to 1080p, then that's enough for me. And I normally look for something that has a built-in microphone so to, to make sure I don't have to carry too much other things with me. Yeah. Got it. Maybe we'll take one, one more question. Uh, someone's asking, how, how can you make classroom management effective online? I think you gave a couple of suggestions, but what? what yeah. uh... I, think, I think the most important part is to, to train your students while you still have them in your class. But basic things like 
uh, if you want to if you want to ask a question you should raise your hand if you if somebody else is talking don't talk wait for wait your turn and the other thing is to to teach them like if if they don't understand or if something is not working well to to let you know by doing that like that game i said stoplight right and those those mini skills is really important and if the students can become efficient in them then the classroom the classroom management will be really well on on the online as well yep. got it okay um i th i think we're sorry I, can i just answer this yes. one question Jessica sure go ahead asking about yeah. how about parent management sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one oh uh, yeah that that is a whole new webinar by itself um what we did is i i um i i believe that we should just we should inform the parents the same way we inform students uh sometimes we think because our parents they automatically understand but they also need to be informed of what is going to, to happen. For example, if we if we are having an online class, I will let the parents know, like oh, today at this time, we are having this class and this is the purpose and this is what they need to do. So to keep them informed, and sometimes we also have to change opinions. Like um, some parents, some parents will come up with questions and you have to address those. You have to tell them. And sometimes parents do make, they can, they, their thinking might be a little bit in a different uh, direction. So you have to give them good reasons or good solutions of why, why you are doing this and what is the purpose of going in this direction. So by just including them in the conversation and including them in the learning, that really helps them to understand more. Because if you're gonna teach online, then the parents is going to be the ones in the background. They're the ones that's going to have to solve the problems or help the students if something goes wrong. So it's always helpful to to help them. All right. Uh, All right. I hope I answered your yes. question, Jessica. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question, Werner, and thanks for the answer, Werner. Um, I think because of time, I want to make sure that we finish with a couple of uh, quick announcements before people log out. Uh, Werner, sure. would you advance the slide real quickly? Uh, first off, um, okay, so, uh, here, it, uh, so we understand these are kind of unusual times um, and at National Geographic Learning, we're, we're here to help you uh, to adjust to a new way of teaching and, and helping students. Uh, so the, often that means obviously uh, teaching and, and uh, doing classes online. Um, we have a new website that has a ton of new re, uh, resources. Uh, this, is a, um, this is our online professional resources site. Uh, so this is, help, uh, this is to, there to help teachers prepare online lessons um, it shares uh, recordings of webinar, other webinars about how to get up and, and running online. Um, these include things from tra teacher trainers, professors, authors, uh, even National Geographic Explorers and, and some of our recorded webinars, um, as well as links to helpful blog posts, which are written by experts in the field on, on best practices in teaching. Uh, another thing that you can find on there are uh, free downloadable eBooks uh, uh, that can help you with your own professional development as you're becoming a online teacher. Um, right now on the screen, you'll see a, a, the, um, the page for our webinar series. So we also, in addition to this webinar, we have a bunch of other global webinars that, that run throughout the year. Uh, you can watch recorded or live webinars. Again, these will feature uh, folks like Werner, uh, teacher trainers, uh, editors, uh, authors, National Geographic Explorers, etc. So there's a lot of great sessions on there uh, that would be useful to, to teachers. Uh, okay, keep going, Werner. Next slide, uh, that we also have an in-focus blog where if you prefer to read. Um, so we have posts that are short, easy to read and really helpful for people looking for quick ideas uh, to get set up in a, in a class. Uh, these include, as you see there in the, the image, uh, a number of these articles are now about the same topic that we're talking about today, getting up and running on, on teaching online and best practices. Okay, so last, uh, second to last thing. If you enjoyed the webinar today, we've got other webinars coming up. Uh, there are two more webinars in this series, which everyone here is invited back to uh, next Wednesday at 10 a.m., same time, same place. Uh, Werner will be back talking about making the most of your time in an online lesson. Uh, and then the following week, Werner is going to return one final time to talk about how to engage learners in an online setting. So those should be really practical and interesting for, for people that want to delve deeper into this topic. 
we also have uh, something coming up this Friday uh, for those of you teaching young learners. There's a session on best practices in teaching reading to young learners with uh, your friendly uh, co-host today, uh, Andrew, who's been typing in the chat box. And he'll be, uh, th that should be a great session for those of you teaching um, reading to young learners. And finally, last thing, uh, if you are, you know, if you'd like this webinar, if you want more information about things that are up and coming from National Geographic Learning, please do uh, be sure to follow us on, um, uh, on our social channels. Uh, you can follow us on the National Geographic Learning WeChat account. Um, we have a Facebook page. Uh, there is the, the URLs, uh, the URL for the Facebook page is there on the left. And you can also use the QR code on your screen if you want to go take them directly to all of the options, um, including uh, keeping in touch via email, via our website, via um, our social uh, media channels as well. So we hope to see you again soon. Thank you guys very much again. Thanks from all of us at National Geographic Learning and uh, hope to see you all again soon. All right, have a good day. Thank you again, also, Werner. I appreciate it. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.